Tackle It Health and Wellness Society bring to you Telling Their Stories, a podcast that brings to you testimonies from families and friends of Canadian high school and university-aged football players who have had a member pass away by suicide or who are dealing with mental health issues or illness themselves. My name is Katie Utley, founder of Tackle It. I will be interviewing families and others who may be experiencing or have experienced these tragic and difficult life circumstances and mental health challenges. I will also be chatting with other mental health and wellness professionals and coaches about these issues. Conversations may deal with sensitive issues such as depression, substance abuse, suicide, sexual assault, and more, and may trigger an emotional response from you. This may not be the right series for you, or you may want to watch and or listen with a trusted adult or friend. If at any time you are in crisis, please call Kids Help Phone at 1-800-SUICIDE. 784-2433. Also listed on our website at tackleit.org or visit crisisservicescanada.ca. Opinions of our guests are their own. We wish to bring perspectives from all sides and walks of life as everyone can learn from something from others' experiences and viewpoints. We aim to respect those views and opinions. And now let's honor those who are telling their stories stories. We have Brad McGee with us today. I'm going to let Brad kind of introduce himself. I just met him. He's got a wealth of experience in the mental health area and coaching and teaching and all of this great stuff, counseling. And we're just going to hear from him about his story. And then we're going to have a a really good conversation just around this topic. So Brad, take it away. You bet. Thanks, Katie. Yes, uh, Katie's already introduced me by name. So I'll tell you that I am from Southwestern Ontario. I was uh, born here in London, Ontario, spent some time in Germany as my father was in the Air Force and then came back to Ontario and have lived here ever since. I was uh, a high school football player and I did play uh, college football. My, uh, My career path took me towards teaching. I taught at a local high school for 30 years. It happened to be the high school that I attended just worked out that way. There was a job availability and uh, I fell in love with the community when I was in high school and continued to love and nurture the community as, uh, as I worked through my 30 years of uh, teaching. I also did a lot of coaching. Uh, I coached 80 teams when I was in high school. Wow. Uh, other people have done the same and they may have done it with a lot more success than me. Uh, I like to think that uh, coaching football uh, for about 34 years and coaching track and field, basketball, uh, wrestling, bit of baseball uh, and fitness, obviously the the workouts in the off season was all part of a ministry for me. Um, Not that I'm a churchy person, but the uh, it was an opportunity for me to extend the teaching that I was doing in the classroom. And I was learning so much myself at the same time about uh, leadership, the development of leadership, and also about mental health, my own and that of the athletes that I coached. Uh, I'm a very nurturing person, according to the people who know me. Unfortunately, I'm also a person that has struggled with mental health since uh, probably the early teen years. Okay. It seemed, seemed to be cyclical for me. Uh, every four years, it was a deep and dark valley of depression. So it followed me into my university years and into my teaching years. And I, I, uh, I dealt with it in different ways, probably because I was so focused on my physical health, I found myself turning away from substances uh, and instead becoming uh, hypervigilant about being fit obsessive about running, weightlifting, just coaching in general. And uh, there is a price for that. Uh, I was an absent father. I was an absent Mm -hmm. spouse. I was great with everybody else's kids, but I wasn't always around for our child. So I I have regret about that. Um, I think that uh, coaching itself was a form of of coping for me. It might even be considered self-harm, though I loved it. Uh, I felt that if I was exhausted uh, at the end of the day, my thoughts would not spin nearly as much. And I could at least lay down and sleep uh, rather than than going over the day's events 
in my head. That uh, that was my career. That was my story. And uh, I have many, many good memories of my time as a high school teacher and a high school coach. I'm still coaching some track and field uh, and do hope to coach football again. But I'm now retired from education. I work uh, in the funeral business and I also work part time as a technician for one of my former students. He's uh, he has a, a lawn sprinkler company and I'm a technician for that. So that's uh, that's what I do, Katie. Thank you for sharing that. That's um, I always appreciate when people step out and and are vulnerable and and honest about where they're at, where they're at, and where what they've been through. And I really appreciate that because I think that it's important for people to see that we're all real, real human beings, and we all experience some forms of either mental, maybe not illness, but mental unhealth. And there's times when we thrive and when we don't. And I think it's really important for people to see kind of both and ends of the spectrum. So let me ask you this, you know, you said that you've experienced and you, I'm assuming maybe I shouldn't, that you still experience, you know, bouts of depression. You said it was cyclical. Was there things that triggered those cycles or was it just random? I'm just trying to understand kind of why it came and went. Mm-hmm. Certainly, there were triggers uh, during my my time as an educator. First of all, I I really worked hard to make sure that I was prepared as a classroom teacher, and uh, was a little a bit obsessive about you know lesson planning and and uh, structuring practice plans and making sure that uh, everybody got along and and that uh, our time together was meaningful and that we even if we weren't winning, we were, we were at least growing as a group. And I'd, I'd like to say that I've had great success in that area. Unfortunately, um, because I, uh, I stewed about perfection all of the time, it, it, it eventually uh, led to a, uh, an overabundance of stress and then stress would lead to depression. Generally near the, the, the last third of the season, I was, I, I was just running on fumes. I didn't have much left. Had a lot of chest pain, a lot of headaches, a lot of fatigue, um, and uh, just wasn't able to make decisions quickly. And, and uh, I was so fortunate to work with other coaches who recognized that I was faltering, and and uh, they would mm. they would take over. I always had wow. strong coaches that were with me, so it was, it was helpful. One of the uh, if I was to identify that thing, there was a trigger for my bouts of long depression. It was that even though I, I'm not a person that engages in conflict with anyone, I hate conflict, uh, but uh, there I, I had uh, a habit of fighting for justice and the underdog. And there were people in my circle of professionals uh, who at times I felt were being persecuted by people that had authority. And I took them on. I yeah. um, you know, they, they were either students or they were staff and they were, they were vulnerable in my eyes. And I decided that, uh, that wasn't fair. And I, I chose to challenge, uh, the people who were in authority. And, uh, to this day, um, the only regret I have about that is that there, there was an incredible price to pay for my spouse who had to watch me wither, uh, as, uh, I endured a lot of criticism for that. Um, and so, and that's the way the hierarchy works. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't as aware of that hierarchy when I was in my younger years. Yeah. And, uh, I'm not so sure that it would have stopped me from, from doing what I did, but I think I would have had a better, better understanding of the repercussions oh, yeah. that, uh, you know, that, that was against the rules and therefore I was going to pay the price. Yeah. So that, uh, that happened to me and, uh, and it really, it really wore me down to, to be, perceived as a negative force within education mm-hmm. when really what I was trying to do was help people who could not help themselves. Yeah. And it extended into my relationship with my students and it extended into uh, my growing awareness as a counselor that the board that I was working for was not doing enough to help them. And therefore I spoke out about that and, uh, I think you know the pattern by now. So I wanted to end my career as a well-respected teacher 
by all parties. And I think uh, I was able to accomplish that within the school that I taught and in the community where I taught, but not with the upper administration. Right. That wasn't that wasn't possible. And and I still think about that today. It's mm. been uh, it's been challenging. So I'm sure there will be people out there that will relate to that. It's a choice that you make. Um, yeah. You have to know why you're doing what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And you have to deal with the consequences of that. Yeah. Well, I did not do that very well. That's uh, I'm putting my energy into other things now and getting over that as best I can. You know, you said you started to experience that earlier, early in your life using fitness. Uh, you've mentioned obsessiveness and perfectionism. What were parents or guardians or the people that were surrounding you at that time in high school and university? Were they recognizing this in you or did you hide that? Or was there anyone to step in and say, you know, uh, what's going on? Are you okay? Or did you voice concern to anybody? How did that look for you? Yes. Um, early on, I dated uh, the girl that I am married to at this time. We've been married for 36 years. Uh, we dated in grade 11. We knew each other in grade nine. Yep. And, uh, you know, over time, she, um, and you know, she was a very strong person, still is very even keeled emotionally, but uh, picked up on, on these mood changes pretty quickly and uh, held me accountable as to to our growth as a couple to our growth as a family and uh i sought help uh from a family doctor when i was 28 years of age and you know what what is uh, counterintuitive katie is the fact that in our family we have we have eight nurses and we have three doctors and you would think that a kid that grew up in a family like that would at least be able to turn to somebody in their family and say something but it was it was the wrong thing to do in our in our family. It was like you know the the uh, auto mechanic that drives a piece of junk to work every day. My family we we didn't necessarily talk about ourselves. It was a cultural thing. It was um, just a family thing, and, and there were so many of us in the family that were struggling emotionally. But uh, I didn't share that information because I didn't know how to share it. Mm. I first of all didn't really know what was happening to me, but it wasn't until. Uh, I guess it was uh, when I turned 27, just just before our daughter was born, that um, I I finally said to my mom and my dad, my dad being a doctor, my mom being a nurse, and I said, look, I'm not well. I know I'm not well. I need help. Um, I'm not even well enough to know that I need help. I'm not even well enough to seek help. I just... I just need you to help me. So they immediately, uh, you know, jumped on the bandwagon and were able to get me uh, an appointment with a psychiatrist. And they uh, they put me on a medication that uh, it may not necessarily have stabilized my mood. And of course, like most SSRIs, that doesn't happen for six weeks anyway. It's not in your bloodstream. But uh, just being able to have a conversation with someone uh, who is professional and uh and was able to to listen and uh, and then give me some feedback was very helpful for me. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I, that was a breakthrough time for me. And then I met someone within my profession whose husband was going through long bouts of depression. He was a lawyer. He had the courage to tell his coworkers what was happening with him, and that prompted me to do the same. Oh. I uh, I sought help for that and. Uh, I started to learn, well, you know, what depression meant and how anxiety contributed to that. I started to learn how to manage my anxiety and uh, learned that I was managing it poorly for many, many years mm. and that uh, I needed to have a better strategy. I needed to put a lot more time into self-care rather than um, just trying to bury it, to push it down yes. with other, other techniques. Oh, and then... Um, it was at that time in my life when I started to become very aware of other people's mental health in, in a very strange way. I, I mean, I, I would pick up on serotonin levels that were not healthy within my midst, uh, people who were colleagues, even students. And of course, you have to be very careful about saying to someone, you're not well. You yeah. know? But you know, you know when you're talking to someone that you're talking to a zombie, you're talking to someone who's pretending their way through good health. And I know you can relate to this, Katie, because you've been there 
when someone is really suffering and they're not wanting to tell you, you desperately want to grab them and you want to say, I, you know what, I can help you. I can, I can relate to what you're feeling. I know we, you know, together we can do this. And, and uh, that uh, desire to help other people led to a, an, uh, me getting into counseling where those kinds of emotions and those desires to help other people just expanded and I became very enthralled with helping other people. And that in itself was therapeutic for me yeah. to help other people. I was still unwell. I knew I, I, knew I was. Mm -hmm. I knew I had a long way to go to improve my own health. But each and every person that I met, almost without exception, was therapy for me. Of course, the grade 10 girls were the most challenging, Katie, I got to tell you right now. Because they were different from one to the start of the week to the end of the week. But I I learned that it was just a roller coaster ride for them. I just I just couldn't keep up with it. And and I realized that being male, I was at a disadvantage. And that was okay with me. I I learned about the strengths of, of my female counselors. I yeah. could see in them an ability that I couldn't attain. And I relied heavily upon them. And even in the time that I was a counselor, which was for almost 10 years, I learned to pretend female empathy. I couldn't feel it necessarily, but I could, I could almost pretend it. Yeah. And, um, it's, a, it's a powerful, powerful uh, gift, um, you know, and, and I think it's within our DNA, you know, and, um, and not, not saying that male counselors aren't good at what they do. I mean, they all have different strengths, but um I just, uh, I think we have to combine those two genders to uh, to sometimes beat back some of these mental health conditions. So you mentioned the grade 10 girls. So now I'm curious, switching into more of uh, your coaching role, how were your athletes? How did you, um, were you still able to, were you able to recognize if you saw uh, one of your players that was struggling or? Yeah. Oh, for sure. I mean, we spent an incredible amount of time together, as right. you know. Uh, being an athlete yourself, and uh, there there were those moments, uh, especially in track and field, with many of the young women that I worked with who were high performance, especially the endurance athletes, the ones that ran 800 meters and above. They struggled with uh, self harm and they struggled with eating disorders. It was rampant, and um, it got to the point where uh, I felt, as a coach, that I was endangering endangering them by that allowing them to continue. Some of them were were showing up to meets and they hadn't eaten in a day. I know that sounds so crazy, but it was it was a common thing um, at that time, and the um, it became clear to me that that many of us, including myself, were were trying to gain a control that we couldn't have. For me, I was in a sense controlling my anxieties by being the super coach, the super mm -hmm. teacher, trying to help as many people as I could. It was like I really need to help you so that I can help me. And yet I saw in the athletes that I was coaching that they were trying desperately to gain control over their lives, but they were doing it in microscopic ways, like denying food or working extremely hard uh, in, and exhibiting uh, a condition called anorexia athletica, where they just push, 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 push until they are completely exhausted, which I engaged in for years and years as an athlete and even as a coach. So, yes, I did recognize it. And the difference between the young women and the young men was that the, uh, the young men came to football with aggression that was not necessarily healthy. And uh, it would come out, especially in, in uh, competitive situations, and they would lose emotional control. And I found myself trying to talk to a young young man that had lost control. And it was, uh, it, at that particular moment, there's not a whole lot you can do. You mm -hmm. can sit them down. Uh, they always knew that there was, in addition to the penalties that they may have endured on the football field, there were penalties that they were gonna endure from their coaches. And uh, that was having to watch their, their teammates play. But it also offered me the opportunity to follow up with them and say what you're feeling on the field right now is something that, that a lot of people have gone through and 
we're going to go after it. We're going to try as best we can to break it down and figure out what is the trigger that causes you to become so angry. Mm -hmm. Why are you here? What are we, what are we trying to accomplish? Look around. These are your brothers. They want you to succeed. I want you to succeed. We accept you as a person, but we cannot accept your behavior. And um, sometimes it was hyper masculinity. It was the way that they, they treated their classmates uh, within school, or it was the way that they treated young women. I only heard about the things that happened within school, but sometimes I heard about things that happened outside of school. And, uh, and I would address it if I felt that it was within my realm of control to do so. But I'd have to say over the years, the role models that young men were attracted to within the football world were unfortunately those that did not necessarily share the values that I was trying to trying to get them to emulate. I coached them to be strong and confident on the field and uh, to even be cocky because that, you know, that persona was, it was helpful for them, especially the defense, uh, you know, that uh, this is our house. You will not come into our house and you will not take over our, our real estate, so to speak. And I, these are all football metaphors that we use. Of course. <laughs> I but, think uh, our listeners get, get that. <laughs> I, I think you would know that. And, uh, and I found myself feeling very aggressive towards, you know, the, the, the other coaches as well. And I, I wanted to win just like they did, but I also told them, you know, we, we are going to be aware of the line and that line is about fair play. You will not talk to the referees in a disrespectful way. You will not trash talk your opponents and will not engage in any kind of play that is deliberate in its intent to hurt. We endured a lot of penalties because that message just was not getting across. And I would ask the team, I said, where'd you get that from? You know, we're, we're, well, you know, so-and-so played for you two, two or three years ago and, you know, he was doing it here and he, he taught me, you know, this is what you do and the referee's not looking and you no, know, these, these were painful things for me to hear. They were going on wow. sort of behind my back and so on, but it was a culture that needed to be addressed. And uh, I can't say that I was uh, 100% successful in trying to, uh, focus the athletes on the many wonderful opportunities that football gave them for building their confidence, uh, working together as a team, uh, learning what it meant to be a leader. Such a great game for those things. Mm -hmm. But uh, there were there were a lot of successes in that area. And I, I more than any other sport that I have coached, football football is the best vehicle for for young men to. Um, to learn how to be a man. And mm -hmm. I don't say that in a sexist way. I think there's so many layers to being a man. And I think the most important one is being self-aware, mm -hmm. but also being empathetic yeah. towards other people. Like you are on a team. You are playing at the highest level you can possibly play right now. This candle will only burn so burn so long. And then you will, you will not play football again. You must give everything you've got to this team while you're here. You've got to aspire to greatness and know that we're getting better every day and we accept you. You are one of us and uh, we're, we're together. We are a team. And uh, that, I, I think that that was a message that uh, it became very easy for me to speak from the heart about those things because it wasn't, to me, it wasn't pretend. It, yeah. it was a very important vehicle uh, for trying to bring out those characteristics in the athletes that I coached. So you are a really good uh, role model because I know I've spoken in other previous podcasts about how modeling behavior and um, being vulnerable with the players and kind of giving them a template of how to do that is very rare for a lot of high school coaches for sure. And, you know, even university coaches. So that's, it's interesting that that came, can I say natural to you? Yeah, I would, I would say that it came fairly natural to me. Of course, I had tremendous role models when I was um, playing football. I had some mm. fantastic coaches in high school, ones that, uh, I mean, I found myself saying the things that they said to, to, um, to me when I was an athlete with them. I was just, I was so, I was so fortunate 
to have people like that and yeah. uh, in in my life and and uh, they have had an influence upon literally thousands of people because those teachings that that uh, that I learned from them I passed on to my athletes and in the interactions with the people in in the league that I was coaching I was so lucky to uh, to coach with people who are far better than me at coaching and even far better than me at the the uh, the role model part you know they they had it they had it all they had an ability to uh, to speak to kids to motivate kids to teach them the fundamentals of the game and and they were competitive people as well and they they could they could do it all so i was really really fortunate and uh, in the league that we coached we we really didn't tolerate the kind of behaviors that perhaps we've seen in professional football that that not very productive let's say they're not they're not contributing to the well-being of the athlete and to the fans so uh, we, we really had a we had a good league and uh, though you know those of us that have coached football for years we run a little hot um, at our meetings and uh, we uh, you know a lot of testosterone but the um, fact is we, we, we were also a brotherhood we were we were really lucky to have each other so I just happened to land in the right place in the universe to be uh, exposed to those kinds of people and I I many of them are retired like me but there are still lots of them that are still coaching yeah and it's, a, it's a difficult a difficult time right now katie especially with this covid situation in our episode that comes out next tuesday our guest um we were talking about um how and i'm going to sp- speak more specifically from f- about males so i do realize that women or girls play football now and that's great but this is more specifically for males um how rites of passage has really been lost and he was saying because he works with um men and families, uh, and counseling. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he was saying that men really have, or boys, I guess now have lost their, their purpose because males are very purpose and rites of passage kind of propel them forward and give them a direction. And now it's like, those things have kind of all been taken away. And so they're floundering. They don't really know what they're doing or where they're supposed to go or how they're supposed to act. And, and it's really been, he's in his practice, it's been quite detrimental um, from, from right down like high school age or younger, all the way up to, you know, forties, fifties, sixties plus, right. For, for men. What do you say to that with, with rites of passage or purpose? What do you think about that? I would say that I could validate that. And I could say, especially in the last 10 to 15 years, I have seen men, young men, flounder uh, as to what their purpose is. Uh, I think that it has been in conjunction with the, uh, the increased strength in, in women, mm. uh, which <laughs> we have a daughter. So I'm very <laughs> happy about that. She's 29 and she's strong. And, and, um, and I just think that, that what, what has happened is, is that, um, Perhaps women don't need men quite as much anymore. And I know that sounds like like an inflammatory statement, but mm-hmm. when I think about the universities, I think I think um, we are about five to one ratio right now in terms of male to f- female to male wow. in the universities in our country. Uh, and uh, watching kids cross the stage at our high school over the last ten to fifteen years, it's always announced as to where they're going and what they're doing. And I have been underwhelmed by the aspirations of our young men. It's wow. been, I'm going to do what's comfortable for me. I'm not going to necessarily do that, which is challenging for me. And so they've taken on the persona of a coasting underachiever, waiting for the easy way to get to where they want to go, but they're not really sure where that is. Yeah. And um, I think that, that, um, the class clown, the, the young male that, that doesn't necessarily push himself in the academic realm is not scorned, is actually encouraged uh, even by both genders. Mm-hmm. And so it becomes the popular way of approaching school is to not take it too seriously if you're, if you're male. And this doesn't apply to every male, but uh, it, does, it did apply to our athletes. And I addressed it with them. I said, in everything that you do, you should be giving it your all whether it's your work, whether it is your schooling, whether it's your sport, your relationships, you know, it, 
we we really I think the game of football uh, requires such precision and such a level a, a level of performance where everybody has to give it their all. Otherwise, the systems break down, and that's what football is. It's system after system after system, and it requires repetition. And I said, greatness comes from the repetition of the right behavior. Now, mm-hmm. how are you suddenly going to become really good at being a student if you're rehearsing being the class clown every day in class? It just doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. So why don't you try something different and see how your friends respond when you start acting the way that you're supposed to act in mm. class yeah. rather than attracting all that negative attention. But that persona, I mean, it's glorified in the media. It's glorified in music. It's glorified in so many areas that I think it's very confusing for young men. We could talk about young men and the difficulties that they're having with their identity. But the the group that I see having the most difficulty, and maybe it isn't the topic of discussion today, is young women, because I think Mm -hmm. they're completely confused about what's expected of them and, Mm -hmm. you know, what they're to aspire to, how they're supposed to dress, how they're supposed to act. um, What am I supposed to feel? You know, it's incredibly difficult for for them because Mm -hmm. of the expectations upon them. But the men have fallen into a a similar situation where they're sort of adrift. Um, The best way I could describe is it's like they're walking on sand, which is shifting under their feet all the time. Well, I I thought, I thought the economy was going to be good. Now the house prices are up about five times what they should be. I thought I was going to get a job in this area, but now I don't know. They're laying people off or, you know, I thought marriages were forever, but my parents just split up. Yeah. Those kinds of things, I think, create that feeling of walking on that shifting sand. Mm-hmm. And it's that uncertainty that, um, you know, the volatility in, in one's life. And then add to that a pandemic. My I was God. just going to ask you, what do you think the pandemic has done to? It's just exacerbated everything. Yeah. It's, and then on top of that, the services that would naturally or normally be available to young men and women that are struggling with their mental health are not as available. And so we see self-harm going way up. We see uh, suicidal ideation going way up. We see suicide going up. You know, it's no secret. The pandemic, the correlation between those things happening in the medical world and the pandemic is irrefutable. You know, the next pandemic is going to be a mental health crisis. There is there is a price to pay for this. And uh, that's why I think that as we try and get back to a state of normalcy, we, we must address the youth those that are 13 to 25, because that's really the age group where making that transition from young adult to adulthood is so complex. They've sort of been left in this vortex where they're spinning and spinning and spinning. Or they're not really sure where they're going to land. They need school so that they can have a sense of normalcy in their life. Even then, we don't know what's going to happen in the next month with the, the variant. And so there, that, that uncertainty is only contributing to that feeling of walking on shifting sand hmm. for both genders. Yeah, that's a great analogy. I like that. Um, I don't like the reason why I like it. You know, you're a, you're a powerful person. You, you reach out for these to understand what's happening. And maybe that for you is, is something that's tangible. Um, to me, I, I am a seeker. I like to know, you know, what I'm up against um, whenever I would plan strategy to attack another opponent's uh, defense or offense, whatever. I, I would always think, okay, where, where's the area of weakness? What am I going to go after? Where's the area of strength? And uh, I find, you know, that, that approach to mental health is helpful helpful for me. And I think what we need to really put our time and energy into is, uh, as I've said to you before, normalizing distress and normalizing the process of seeking help. So um, a prevention model that um, is, it's a part of the high school environment and, and they try, they do, they really do try. But of course, in Ontario, you only have to take one course of physical education. So therefore you're only exposed to one health course. In other classes, they don't talk about mental health. It, it can fit into certain curriculums. Actually, it could fit into all curriculums. You could even incorporate it into math class. Yeah. But with the pressure upon teachers to fulfill the requirements of the curriculum, if it isn't written in there specifically, they don't necessarily teach it. And, uh, and many teachers don't want to touch mental health issues with a 10 foot pole. No. So, so we need to make it more a part of the conversation. Yeah. We were, I was saying that to a couple other people um, 
Well, one more f- football related was, you know, how they have safe contact certifications uh, with Football Canada specifically. And um, I said, should there be some sort of mandatory either online class or or something that coaches have to take a basic mental health course or a seminar clinic, whatever, however that looks just to get a baseline of mental health and illness and when to refer how to ask questions, maybe because we uh, we're not expecting them to become experts. That's not what that's about, but being Mm -hmm. able to have a a base level information so that they can recognize when to maybe step in or come alongside somebody who they think is, is floundering. But I had also kind of thought, why aren't these courses, why aren't these courses being taught in or making it be a mandatory course, like a math class in high school or even up into university? Like it doesn't, you know, we, I grew up with what they called calm, which, which, which was C-A-L-M, which was like a lifestyle course. You learned how to make a budget and whatever else. I don't, I don't actually remember what I learned in that class. But. <laughs> it might be somewhere in your subconscious. But just something like that, where it is a mandatory class that these kids have to, I call them kids, but these young adults have to, that they do have to take so that they, it is talked about and it is more normal and that type of thing. But for some reason, I I find that in my own conversations with people, there's a lot of resistance to do that. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm curious as to why, is it because it's so based on like the more, the higher school scores you get in your school, the more money you get, like for academics, like, I don't know where the, I don't know why it's, it's such a hard thing to, to put a a good value on. I can't tell you exactly why, but I can tell you one of the reasons why a mental health model that is more expanded is not being introduced into high schools. It's because we're not good at it. We're not Mm -hmm. good at it. And the second reason is that it's not cool. Kids do not necessarily want their teachers talking to them about mental health issues. Mm-hmm. I, I forced it upon my students probably because I, I was a counselor and uh, I had the mental health background. But even then, when I was coaching, I had to be very careful about not talking about mental health too much yeah. because the young men that I coached wanted to maintain a persona that they were invincible that they, mm. they had a strength that would withstand a hurricane. Yeah. And I, I fed, in, fed them information that would, that would help them to believe that, you know, they can overcome things. I would never say to them, you know, this, on this particular day, you know, it's Monday and you might be feeling a little blue. Um, you know, some of you might be actually enduring uh, bouts of depression. It's quite common in your age group. I mean, that, that was, that's the kiss of death. Because, you know, you you plant that seed and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think Mm, the most important thing you can do um, as a coach is it might be trickery, but you structure your program in such a way that the best thing those kids could possibly be doing for their mental health is to be distracted by being involved in something that is purposeful, that's going to make them stronger as human beings. You don't have to talk about mental health issues in order for kids to get stronger, but they have to realize that when at the end of the day, that those individuals that are in a leadership position are human beings and that they are, they're capable of mistakes. They're capable of feeling self-doubt. They're capable of, of falling short of the goals that they've set and that we're all like that. Yeah. But we we aspire to greatness. We push boundaries. We try and do amazing things. And we lean upon each other to do that. What concerns me about some of the attitudes that are anti-competition is that you don't necessarily provoke that kind of response from a team if it's not a serious endeavor. Yeah. If you say to them, okay, we're going to go out and we're going to play Ultimate Frisbee. One of my favorite games, by the way. We're going to just go out and have fun. We're going to play the music. You know, we're going to. And uh, we're just going to run around and be silly and uh, we're just going to have fun for an hour and we're going to get in shape doing it. Well, okay, that's great. But without the structure, without uh, pursuing something bigger than yourselves, without having to work together through adversity, Mm -hmm. you don't get the same kind of growth. Yeah. You need to be pushed and you need to be pushed by leaders who have your best interests at stake. 
Mm. People, people with knowledge, yeah. people with competence, people with the ability to empathize so that when an athlete is not able to perform because of mental health issues, uh, physical issues, or even family issues, whatever it might be that, that that individual can empathize and can find a way through problem solving or through personal experience, whatever, to try and keep them engaged in the team. And having sat in the emergency department with, with many a student for different ailments, from a dislocated finger to a suicidal ideation, that's when real growth happens. Mm. You sit next to that kid and you keep, you keep telling the same story. Hey, we're in this together. You are strong. We are going to make it. This is not the end of the road for you. you your brothers are waiting for you and you, know, you wow. need to get better. All of those all of those messages it can be shared within the realm of, of football. And they can be shared in a lot of different sports, but football, it's just it's got a magical recipe. And, and I often say, just let the game teach you. Don't, you know, I'm, oh, I'm okay. knowledgeable. But the game will teach you the lessons that you need to learn. Wow. Just let it teach you. And eventually, you know, our captains, they take over, they do the coaching in the last part of the season. In many instances, it's good or bad teams, but the captains who get it, they shout that message like we are together. We must be strong. We're going to get, we're going to get through this. And, and um, many of the players uh, that I've had the pleasure of, of coaching have come back to coach. There was one year in particular, we had nine coaches and eight of them were, were grads from the school. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Uh, that was validation for all of us. Yeah. You know, it was a good experience for you. You, you, you know, I've never felt that my purpose as a high school coach was to prepare kids for the next level. My purpose was to prepare them for life. And if they were fortunate enough to play at the next level, well, kudos to them. Yeah. You know, it meant that they, they couldn't live without football. They wanted more of it. They were willing to make that sacrifice that you and I both know is so necessary to play at the college level. Mm-hmm. But, you know, a lot of the 90, Eight percent of the students that I had the pleasure of coaching never went past high school to play football, but yeah. they carried they carried the lessons that football had taught them into that next realm of life, whether it be work or whether it be family or whether it be education. Just being a good citizen, the football environment, the, the framework allowed you to prepare for life like no other sport that I've coached. So then maybe instead of a mental health certificate or course, maybe we should be getting our coaches to take a leadership course. Yeah, I think one follows closely behind the other because a great leader is someone that is in tune with the followers. And the followers of today are kids, as we know, one in seven has a mental health issue. Yeah, one in seven. One in seven. And if you if you think that you're coaching a bunch of people who are all mentally healthy, then you're fooling yourself. So these, these individuals show up, they're on your team, they're in the school or, you know, whether, whether you're coaching within the high school realm or whether you're coaching in a community league, you're going to, you're inevitably going to run into people who need you to help them with their issues. They may not be able to verbalize it. They may not even know what those issues are. They may not even have symptoms yet, but when they do have those symptoms, you can implement into your program things that will help them, such as, okay, let's figure out what, where am I at right now? Self-awareness. Okay. The score is tied. It's late in the fourth. They're on our 10 yard line. How do I feel about me? Like what, what is it within me that's going to allow me to be successful? What have I been taught? Focus on, focus on the skill, lean on your teammates, do your job. This, that, and the other thing. And when those mental health crises come up, you tend to draw upon those transferable skills. Mm. And, uh, you know, how do you, how do you verbalize what you're feeling? How do you gain control of your emotions? You know, you're going to count to five before you blurt out something you shouldn't have said on the bus ride home when we just got our asses kicked. That's, you know, that's a skill. You, you've got to rehearse those things. So, yeah. uh, I, and I think, you know, it's, I said earlier, it's a bit of trickery, but I don't immerse coaching conversations with mental health terms. Mm-hmm. I, don't talk, I don't talk about depression. I don't talk about anxiety. I don't talk yeah. about emotional pain. I, I just, I talk about, you know, 
this is the game. This is what it requires. You've got to be mentally tough and lean on us when you don't feel that way. When, you, when you've got an issue, we want to know about it. How do you think our football community can draw on that magic to build a stronger community of football players, athletes, but even outside of football, you know, your track athletes or your families or all of that kind of stuff. How can we come together and and try and build something that's stronger and more sustainable and not the one in seven? That's a devastating statistic. I really think that uh, within our high school environment, even though I've I've talked a lot about high-performance sport and I've coached a lot of high-performance athletes, I, I think that the the sport realm within high school should still engage in structured sport, but we really need to focus more on, on getting more students involved in sport. Mm. And I, I know thinking about you, Katie, I'm sure you were, you were that top five or, or 8% of your high school population that played all sports and you were, you know, you, every team you tried out for you made and, and, uh, and you were given, you know, the attention that a great basketball player would be given. You would be one of 12 that would be on the girls, senior girls basketball team. That's 12 girls that had the opportunity to be exposed to life-changing opportunities. And, and even though life is challenging, you had something more than some of those non-athletic girls. My desire when I was in, in high school was to see more participation in structured sport not free time in the gym. I, I hated that. I, I wanted kids to be doing things with adult supervision, like, okay, we're going to play, we're going to play volleyball, but it's going to be structured. You know, you're, you're going to play, you're going to play hard. You're going to learn the skills. You're sure we'll have music on and, you know, but you show up in the right uniform and you come and you play those kinds of things in a greater volume need to be pursued at the high school level. And what I think we need to do as a community is get away from the intense pressure we place upon our athletes to constantly get to the next level. We should be focused on the level that we're at right now. And um, I live, I live in hockey central right now. This is, this is the heart of skill development within AAA hockey players. We have the London Knights here. They have the largest number of athletes that have made it to the NHL. There are a number of young men and young women this year that are aspiring to the next level, which is the, you know, there's junior B, junior C, and then there's junior A. Junior A is a really high level of hockey that then leads to the NHL. You can also go through NCAA scholarships to the United States and you can play hockey there. You know, people that have done that. I know people have done that, but at a young age, it's hockey, 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 hockey. It's, you know, you're, you're playing three on three hockey in the spring. You're playing hockey competitively from September 7th until late into March. And Mm -hmm. then you're off to summer camps and you're, and you're training. Even when you're 14 years of age, you're already weightlifting girls and boys. There needs to be more opportunity to play a number of different sports and there needs to be a better feedback loop to ensure that the athlete is thriving, not the parent, but the athlete is Mm -hmm. the athlete thriving because you know, when you're 11 years old and you're playing at a high performance level, sometimes the only thing you're really excited about is the ice cream you're going to get after the game. For me, it was the orange slushy. <laughs> okay, well, there you go. And you're a super athlete. The orange <laughs> slushy. Well, gee. In soccer. <laughs> there we go. You just admitted it. Your your soccer coach is probably <laughs> rolling her eyes right now. But but that feedback loop just doesn't exist. And no. when I when I go to hockey arenas and not to be too hard on hockey, because it happens within a number of sports, but, and I hear parents and I hear the comments that they're making from this, from the stands to their kids or to the referees. I know that we've lost our way as parents. We mm-hmm. just don't get it. We just don't understand that, you know, this is a small child out there and, and their chances of making it to the, to the pros are like one in 300,000 and you're just wearing them down. Why are you doing that? Get them involved in a lot of different sports. Make sure that that it's structured. Make sure that it's productive and that you find out from the child, from the coaches, the feedback that is necessary in order to get the information you need, indicating that the child is growing, that they're healthy, that they're growing. Yeah. 
because, you know, many young, I remember an athlete saying to me and he was in, in our area, you know, offset is the highest level for a high, for a high school athlete to aspire yeah. to the high school level. And he said to me, he was one of our best hurdlers in track and field. And, and he said, Mr. McGee, I'm not doing track next year. I said, what, what do you mean you're not doing track? You just got the bronze medal in the 300 meter hurdles. You're one of our best athletes. He said, you know, just because I'm good at this sport doesn't mean I have to like it. And it wow. just floored me. I could not believe that that kid was just educating me. Just because I'm good at it doesn't mean I have to like it. He was anxious before every race. I watched him barf at the start line for the offset final. And um, he just hated it. He hated the anxiety that it created. He hated the training. He hated the pressure his parents were putting upon him. He turned away from that sport. And he never came back. Feedback loop. Got it. You, you have to know. You have to know what's going on. So I think that's really, really important. And I think of getting a, a greater volume of kids involved and making the high school a center, a hub for that kind of activity and incorporating into that hub the mental health resources that are just down the hall. Because mm -hmm. if that becomes the mecca for the kids, where it all happens and where the community comes and gathers and there's mental health resources just down the hall or just in a building separate from the school, I don't care. But if, if it's part of their ecosystem, then they are more apt to seek help. So going back to normalizing distress and normalizing help seeking, use sport to gain the trust of the athletes so that they know that mental health issues are, are sometimes a part of life and that sometimes we have to go and seek help so that we continue to play our sport. And life is a sport. Mm -hmm. Life is competitive. Life is thrilling. Life is unpredictable. It's just a big game. Mm -hmm. and you have to learn to play it. And your, your mental health has to be managed. You have to practice good mental health techniques, self-care. I'm hoping that just one person is inspired by this conversation. It would be nice if more were, but if it's just one, and uh, God willing, if it's someone that that uh, that you know or that I know, that would be even better. I just take my hat off to those coaches out there that are that are giving up so much of their their time and their talent and their yeah. heart to uh, to try and and uh, create a better world, a better community. I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your experience and your knowledge, your heart. Your passion. I think that that's uh, this has been a fantastic conversation and one that I think a lot of people can resonate with and learn from. I know I have. I actually felt like I was back on the football field for a minute there, <clears throat> but uh, that, you can't take that, it out of you. Can't take that, it out of you. Yeah, I guess it is still there. And I, uh, I, I think what you're doing is great. And uh, I thank you so much for uh, allowing me to participate in such a worthy endeavor. For more information on Tackle It and how you can become a Tackle It ambassador, you can visit our website at tackleit.org. If you would like to tell your story, please email us at tellyourstory@tackleit.org. We all need a champion, and we bring you these with those who are willing to tell their story.